G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. The 2024 AFL Draft is right around the corner. So I thought I'd do a different style format video today where I look at every single team in the league and I try and look at who is probably an ideal target for the first selection in this year's draft. I've been doing heaps of mock drafts, uh, but naturally those tend to focus on more teams than others. There's several teams that don't have a selection in the top 30, so I haven't featured in my mock drafts yet. So this video, we'll be looking at who's kind of the ideal first pick for every club in the league. Bearing in mind, after the top handful, it gets very hard to isolate one. Nonetheless, we'll just use this as a platform, as an opportunity to talk about each team's first selection in particular. So the plan is to go through all 18 teams in the competition in the order in which they enter the draft. So we'll start with Richmond, who entered the draft at peak one, and we'll move our way down to Collingwood, who entered the draft at pick 52. Bearing in mind, of course, this gets thrown out if any of those clubs decide to trade in, that changes what their first picks are. But nonetheless, for the time being, we'll just focus on what is their current nominal first pick in this year's draft and discuss a few targets. Obviously, after the first about five teams, it gets harder to isolate just one player, and I do think that clubs probably just look at a list of players that they'd be happy to select and hope are available. But like I said, we'll get into all of that. At the moment, I'm trying to hit 33,000 subscribers by the day of the draft, guys. So thank you to everyone who's jumped on board. If there's anyone who's been enjoying the content, about 50% of the people that watch my videos haven't actually hit subscribe. So if you are getting something from it, I'd appreciate it if you did and help me reach my goal. All right, let's crack into it and start with the easy stuff. So we're going to start with the teams that pick first in this year's draft. I'm going to say that Richmond with pick one, who is their ideal pick? Well, this is a real slam dunk in a sense because they're going to pick up exactly who they want as their ideal first pick. Um, I'm going to say it's Sam Lawler. Again, as I currently record this, um, you know, it's not locked in. They're going to take Sam Lawler. Things do change and we've seen drafts, I want to say 2014, 2015, and potentially 2020 as well if you include the Jamara Academy bid situation. Those were drafts where it really wasn't that clear who was going to go pick one or at least not until within about 24 hours of that said draft. Now, we do probably have a consensus pick one, but it's not so strong. Now, I do think Richmond would consider guys like Finn O'Sullivan and Jagger Smith. That is at least what is being reported and that's all we really have to go off. In my opinion, I will say publicly that I think they should choose Sam Lawler, assuming they don't have pick two as well. In any case, I'd be taking Sam Lawler, but I just meant in the scenario where they just have the choice of one of those three, Lawler's the man they're going to go with in terms of you know his upside and his match-winning ability that I think he projects to have at the next level. He's the most dynamic out of those options, in my opinion. He's ready-made. He's got upside, you know, playing a lot of crickets up until this point, meaning he hasn't fully focused on footy, and his ability to impact in the year when he's playing forward, I think, makes him the best product. I expect the second club to come into calculations here will be the Brisbane Lions. Um, it may not be them. It may be North if North don't decide to bid. I think Levi Ashcroft is clearly going to be Brisbane's first selection, so we'll probably skip past Brisbane. I think they'll end up with Ashcroft and Sam Marshall, and there's not too much doubt about that. That. Do they take picks after that? It's unclear, but perhaps they could. Perhaps they could trade back into the draft, but it, with absolutely no idea of what point of the draft that's going to happen, um, we can probably just gloss over the Brisbane Lions here. They'll be very happy to get Levi Ashcroft. So then we go to North Melbourne. I think whatever way you slice it, I think their ideal first pick is going to be Alex Toru. At least that is what is being reported. Now, I do think they need some tall timber, and Toru does present as a very high upside, dynamic style key position player who could potentially play forward one day. I'm not too sure what the plan is there, but I think there is a need both forward and back for North Melbourne here. Now, it's unclear at this current point in time whether a trade is going to happen, and it may not be pick three or whatever that North Melbourne end up with Alex Toru, although they do have to bear in mind there is a risk if they trade too far down in this scenario to get multiple talls, then Toru is probably not going to be the guy they end up with. And I think that is the desired outcome to end up with Alex Toru. And I think while they did draft a key back last year in uh, Will Dawson, and maybe there is a greater need for a key forward prospect than a key back one, I still think what he adds to North Melbourne is, is a big point of difference regardless. And um, my guess is that is the outcome they're going to try and generate is to get Alex Toru. Sorry guys, just a quick intrusion to let you know that this video is brought to you in a paid partnership with BetterHelp. And they're on a mission to make starting therapy easier. I think there are some misconceptions about the value of therapy. And one of those is you need to have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety before you can seek out therapy. I actually think taking the step of seeking therapy and seeking help is actually a sign of strength and self-awareness and helps prevent problems before they arise. And it does take a bit of courage to acknowledge when you need help and taking steps to improve your mental health. So rather than thinking of therapy as something you use when you've got a diagnosed problem, think of therapy as a tool for personal growth. It helps you understand 
expand yourself, you can develop healthier habits. It also provides a safe space to talk. Not everyone in their life has someone that they can go to and express to them what's on their mind. Or perhaps there is someone to talk to, but you don't wanna deal with the fear of judgment or perhaps feeling like you're a burden to them. And there's also the fact that you'll actually be getting guided help from an expert, a mental health professional. So as I said, as the paid partner of this video, BetterHelp's mission is to help starting therapy for you easier. Starting the process with them is really easy. All you have to do is fill out a questionnaire and in most cases, you'll be matched with a therapist within a couple of days. If the therapist that you get doesn't feel like the right fit for you, you can easily switch to another one at no additional cost. They are very careful that the therapists that they get are well qualified and there's also a customer service team if you have any issues. So if you are someone who is struggling and thinks you could benefit from therapy, click the link in the description or go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy. You get 10% off your first month. By doing that, you would be supporting the channel, but you also get 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. Thanks guys, let's get back to the video. So then we've got Carlton entering the draft next at uh, what I expect will be about pick four after a bid. There has been a heavy connection to Finn O'Sullivan. Um, I'm not 100% sure if this is locked in, but this is probably where I'd guess they select. The other options likely to be available to them would be maybe a Jagger Smith or a Sid Draper. Now, a lot depends on whether Richmond trade up to pick two. It does seem less likely than likely, as I currently record this, that that is going to happen, but I think Carlton will be hoping it doesn't. Because if Richmond trade up to pick two, there is a high chance, in my opinion, that they would take Finn O'Sullivan, leaving Carlton to pick an alternative player. Now, who would that be if it's not Finn O'Sullivan? I think they actually might go for Sid Draper over a Jagger Smith just because of that point of difference. He's a very aggressive style midfielder and I think adds something a little bit different to Carlton instead of the hardworking Jagger Smith who gets a lot of possession. I think they'd prefer Sid Draper, but to be honest, if their desired outcome here is to end up with a top echelon midfielder in this draft, they can't really go wrong. Someone is going to be available to them, someone good. But my guess is Finn O'Sullivan being the local product would be their preference, then Sid Draper, then Jagger Smith. But in terms of you know total talent, not a lot separates those boys. Then we got the Adelaide Crows and I think the desired outcome here is Sid Draper. Now, of course, we just mapped out a scenario where maybe Carlton go Sid Draper at their selection. So who do Adelaide pick in that instance? I've made the point previously that I think that, you know, if the homegrown local talent in Sid Draper, who I do think is who they should pick if he is available, because I think there is a chance Sid Draper becomes the best player in this year's draft. I'm a huge fan of him. I've done a whole video discussing him as a prospect and his likely upside. And I think what he's achieved in his top age year while battling in is sensational. I think he's the great selection for them. However, if he's off the table, who do Adelaide go next? Well, their choice would probably be maybe Jagger Smith is available in this scenario. It is possible that Finn O'Sullivan is. Let's say Carlton chose Jagger. I'd say that the next preference would, would be Finn O'Sullivan, but he's probably the least likely to be available there. So for me, it becomes a choice between maybe Jagger Smith and someone like a Harvey Langford. And I would not be surprised if Adelaide decided to go for the taller Harvey Langford, who can play forward and add something different to a midfield that probably is looking for a point of difference there. So I think Sid Draper does present as that. Even though Jagger Smith is considered the higher rated talent, I think their backup contingency may be Harvey Langford. So the top five were all fairly easy for me. At least I have clear opinions on those top five, but it gets a little bit blurrier when you get to Melbourne here because they presumably will just take the best available midfielder who's still on the board at this current point in time. And if I've eliminated Draper O'Sullivan Ashcroft and Lawler, then you're probably looking at guys like Jagger Smith and Harvey Langford. Now, I am not 100% sure which one Melbourne would prefer, which makes picking their ideal pick here a little bit difficult. Jagger Smith is probably the more highly rated talent, and you could easily make an argument it's him, but they'd probably be also keen on Harvey Langford, who presents as a bit more upside. I suppose that's the difference between Jagger Smith and Harvey Langford. It's probably just Jagger Smith has a higher floor, but a lower ceiling. So perhaps I think you'd go best case scenario, Melbourne could go Jagger Smith, but I could also see it being possible that Melbourne prefer the upside pick in someone like a Langford, and they could go Alex Toro as well. So that for me, this one is a very open-ended one for the Demons here. We saw them pick Caleb Windsor last year, which was a little bit of a surprise at the time. Could they do something again? Could they take Bo Allen at their first selection? Now, that would be a big surprise as it currently stands. I'll probably just say Jagger Smith is probably the highest rated of those likely to be available, so probably the selection here. But I'm not convinced that that is absolutely locked in. I think it's possible that Melbourne overlooked Jagger Smith to go for the six foot three midfielder in Langford. Gold Coast and Essendon both have academy boys that might be worth discussing here because I think this is around the range of the draft will get bid on. I'm not 100% convinced on that. It could be a little bit later than this, but let's just discuss them. The Gold Coast Suns 
will get Lombard and, and I don't think there's too much doubt around them not being able to match that. They've uh, clearly moved heaven and earth to get the picks. Essendon as well, Isaac Kako, um, that will certainly be able to get that done wherever a bid falls. Essendon though, I do think will be one to watch and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they are very active in trying to trade back into this year's draft after the bid comes. Now it's very hard to speculate on who they might take in that instance because we don't know where that pick is going to fall. They do hold an extra first round of next year, which means they'll probably try and get into the at least the top 15, I would have thought, in this year's draft. Perhaps, you know, GWS at pick 15 would be one team that they try and trade with. One player I've seen them link to is Job Shanahan. He played really well in their VFL team this year as a, obviously a junior prospect. So there is, there is a loose connection there. Could they trade back in to get Job Shanahan as a long-term partner for Nate Caddy? I think that would offset the Kako pick really nicely and bring in another key forward talent for Essendon. But again, I'm not 100% sure which way they'll go. I don't think there is any clear need for Essendon. Probably just some top-end talent, but I don't think positionally Essendon have a glaring weakness. That might sound silly for a team that missed finals, but uh, I just mean there's no glaring gaps on the list they need to pick. I think they'd probably need to get in the best talent available, and that may be Job Shanahan and that they're lining up for a trade-in. Then we've got St Kilda, whose first pick in this scenario falls at 10. If the bids come earlier, they may not. Um, who would St Kilda pick with their first selection? Well, and again, you're probably looking for a big-bodied midfielder, and so that leaves you Harvey Langford or Josh Smiley. So I'll probably say Smiley here because I'll be surprised if Harvey Langford is still available. You've got a whole, you've got a second pick for Richmond in there. I've lined up Langford as being a possible pick for both the Demons and Adelaide in this scenario. Richmond is one of them. I'd imagine Jagger Smith's gone by now. So let's just say St Kilda is probably holding out for the best available big bodied midfielder. And I'm gonna assume that Josh Smiley is available. So I think that's a really good first selection for them. They do have two in a row unless they trade that second one. But I think all things being equal, Go Josh Smiley with your first pick, and then we'll see what happens next. There's been a few different names linked to them, Travalia, Lindsay, Bo Allen. I've done a whole video on who St Kilda might take with their second selection here, but I'm gonna say their first priority will be the best available big-bodied mid. Maybe Langford, but if he's gone, probably Smiley. We've got the West Coast Eagles likely entering the draft at around about pick 15 here, and they're in an awkward position where a lot of the, you know, the highest rated talents that were kind of linked to them are probably going to be gone. However, I will say they'll be holding out hope for Bo Allen. It's not beyond the realm of possibility that Bow Allen is still available, but it does seem increasingly unlikely that he gets past Richmond, St Kilda and Melbourne are three teams that I've seen uh, having an interest in Bow Allen, but it is still distinctly possible. So if we're holding out for the best case scenario here for West Coast, I'd say that for them, they would probably go the local talent. I think there's an argument to make that as a player, he's probably not the most suited versus guys like Travaglia or Xavier Lindsay. However, I do suspect the Eagles would go local in an evenly rated pool. So they'll hold out hope for Bow Allen. They'll also hold out hope that one of Travali or Xavier Lindsay slides. Past that, it gets a little bit more open-ended. I've got my preference in Ollie Hannaford. That's a player that I really like. But I think, generally speaking, if Bow Allen's there at 15 for West Coast, he's going to definitely get taken, in my opinion. Now we've got Port Adelaide, who are back in the first round of this year's draft thanks to the trade of Dan Houston. So very tough one, I think, to try and guess what sort of position they're looking for. That's usually the first thing I do when looking at a team's ideal selection here. I think Port Adelaide are probably in a position to go best available, which makes aligning them with a player here a little bit harder. We, we are starting to get to the later part of the draft where picking one single player for them um, is a little bit reductive. So what would Port Adelaide do here? I think, I think it's just gotta be a case of best available talent. Maybe you can make an argument that in their best case scenario, it is possible that Harry Armstrong is available here. Now, do they desperately need a key forward? They just traded in Lukosius, but he's a little bit different to Lukosius. Lukosius is a little bit more of a high half forward at times, and he still hits the scoreboard. You've got Todd Marshall there. I don't know where that sits, um, whether there's some doubt around him. You've got Ollie Lord as well. So I don't know if there is a clear need for Harry Armstrong, but I do think it's possible that in their best case scenario, he's available. Other players that have been linked to them are guys like Joe Berry in particular. Maybe they'd go with Xavier Lindsay, but I don't think Xavier Lindsay's likely to be available at this pick here. So maybe it's Harry Armstrong. Do they take the best available tall? I'm genuinely torn about this. I'm not 100% sure. You could easily say, that their best case scenario is someone like a Joe Berry. Alternatively, their best case scenario is maybe a Murphy Reed. However, I found in multiple sources that uh, Murphy Reed might be considered a little bit of a flight risk to interstate team. So I, I also felt uncomfortable about linking him there. Then there's also Taj Hotton, who I think is a high upside type. So who would they prefer out of Taj Hotton and Harry Armstrong? For me, I find it very hard to speculate on that. We've got a very mature team who has loaded up on key backs, has loaded up on rucks recently. And I just talked about their key forward options as maybe not being set in stone, but also not a glaring weakness either. So long story short, I think it could be any one of Harry Armstrong if he's available, because I think that's a good value selection. Could be Joe Berry, could be Taj 
Cotton. Forgive me for sitting on the fence so hard. I think they might be the most difficult team to make a call on for this scenario. Now we got Fremantle probably entering the draft around pick 17 at this current point in time. Now you could say that they're Ideal scenario here is Bo Allen, but I think if I've already attributed Bo Allen to a team with uh, a pick, at least two picks before, it doesn't make sense to say the same thing for Fremantle here, so we'll think differently. What are their needs? They're actually a pretty well-rounded list. Their midfield is strong. Um, they've got some really good tall talent now up forward. Uh, down back, they're pretty strong as well. Good defense, like running types and defensive types. They're a very well-rounded list in my opinion. There has been links to some of the more quality, smaller forwards available in this draft as well. So Joe Berry is one and probably would be one that I think Fremantle would pull the trigger on if he's available. You could also say the same thing about Ollie Hannaford. Why a small forward? Well, they never really replaced Lockie Schultz. And Shea Bolton is a great recruit, but not really the same sort of player at all to Lockie Schultz. So I think a dynamic small forward player, I know they drafted Jack Deline, but that was like pick 60. So they'll probably take a bit more of a high-end talent in someone like a Joe Barry who can play higher up the ground and apply the pressure that someone like a Lockie Schultz did when he played for Fremantle as well. So I think Fremantle would be probably holding out for Joe Berry, but like I said, at this point of the draft, we're really probably thinking best available. I just don't think they'll take a tall or anything like that. Now we've got GWS, and um, I said that Port Adelaide was difficult, and GWS is possibly even more difficult in terms of who they're going to select. So there's been a bit of discussion around them trading this pick, and that is distinctly possible and very hard to speculate on. We do also see a body of work at GWS where they tend to just pick their guys, and they do pretty shrewd character testing, and I think what they're doing is trying to work out which players would be flight risks and which would not. And therefore, it's very hard for me to speculate on who they might take. I might throw Job Shanahan here into the mix. I do think there is some need for a key forward. I know they've got Cadman there, but Hogan's towards the end of his career and Riccardi maybe not set in stone. I think you can afford to go for another key forward here. So Job Shanahan is, you know, he re represented the Allies sort of being from New South Wales, but he's, he's represented Bendigo as well. Geographically, he's not a million miles away from New South Wales, so maybe they'll see that as a factor. That coupled with the fact that he's probably around about best available as well and a somewhat of a position of need, I think GWS would be pretty happy with Job Shanahan. They could go a midfielder as well. I still think there's probably some degree of need to add to that young midfield, so I've talked about Cooper Hines in the past, and maybe maybe they go Cooper Hines a Vic Country Boy, but again, I think we could see a bit of a surprise here with GWS with them just valuing the draft pool, which is already very even, quite differently to what we expect. Now we've got the Western Bulldogs at pick 20 as it currently stands. Well, it's 17 currently, but in this scenario with, with bids likely to come into account, I think pick 20 is where they'll enter the draft. So who is their best available hope. I've done a video on the Bulldogs analyzing what they might do in this year's draft and I've pretty much categorically ruled out the need for a key forward or a key back. There's some need for a Ruckman, they're not going to do it in their first selection here. So maybe adding to that young midfield, some general forwards, some general defenders, those sorts of types are what we're looking at here. I think there is a distinct possibility Murphy Reed's available. So I'm going to put him in here as a player that could be available because he has to get through Richmond's first four picks, which I think is more likely than not, in my opinion. I don't think St Kilda is going to take him that early. I don't think Richmond's going to take him that early. And then you have a whole number of interstate clubs picking in a row and there has been the flight risk tag applied to Murphy Reed. So in my opinion, I'm just making the case for why I think he will be available. And if he is available, he's probably the best available player that the Bulldogs are going to have. And you know, there is some doubt about him becoming a midfielder because of lack of athleticism. At the worst, if that is the case, and he's a high half forward who hits the scoreboard and he's a very talented young kid, that's still kind of a position of need for the Western Bulldogs. I think he would be a great fit for them, and I think it's quite realistic. I can see them going for Hannaford. I can see them going for Joe Berry. But Murphy Reed is probably the highest rated talent out of those three. Now we've got the Sydney Swans, and this is a tough one. I find it so hard to pick for Sydney. Uh, what do they need? I think they're pretty stock for mids. As far as key backs go, they're getting Joel Cochran in this year's draft. They took Patrick Snell last year, so I'm going to rule them out of taking a tall defender with their first selection here. Could they look to add another young key forward or a small dynamic forward? For me, at pick 23 or whatever it's going to be, I find it so hard to, to isolate one player for Sydney. One player that there has been a, a plenty of leaks to is Jack Whitlock. And the argument for him is that he's a 200 centimeter key forward product who is possibly going to be available at their first selection. And I think a key forward could 
be on the agenda here for Sydney. I do find it so hard to pick one player for them. And I certainly don't think, you know, they're holding out hope for a Jack Whitlock. You know, if, if he's not available though, they might just go two smaller types, I don't know. But they do have two selections in this range. And I think, you know, perhaps they'd, they'd like to have Jack Whitlock available with their first one and then maybe go a smaller dynamic player or a general forward or a general defender with their second selection. Again, it's really tough. They've got a very well balanced list. There's no real distinct needs that I can see here for Sydney. So perhaps just adding a project tall at 200 centimeters with a high upside here for Jack Whitlock, I think that could be a good pick for the Sydney Swans. Now we've got three clubs here where it's almost impossible because they don't enter the draft, well in Hawthorne's case, until the early 30s. Uh, what is currently 33, Geelong at 45 and Collingwood at 52. But we can discuss them nonetheless. So Hawthorne at 33. I think are in a position to go best available, to be honest. Again, another team who were pretty well-rounded. I mean, I saw there's some doubt around Mitch Lewis with his ACL, but he's still a very good talent. And Cool Shadir as well this year really alleviated any real doubts around their key forward prospects. Um, they just traded in two key backs. They've invested heavily in the midfield. They've got great general smalls around the ground. Um, their small fours in particular are outstanding. So... Again, I don't really see a clear need for them. If they were to go the key forward route, there's a couple that could hope would be available. Maybe in that top 30 consensus uh, players, John T4 might be the most likely to be available at pick 33. It is distinctly possible. Not necessarily likely, um, but failing that, they'd probably just go best available. I've seen a connection to Thomas Sims as well. Again, in, in a strong and even draft, I think Hawthorne are in the position to simply go best available here. But if I was going to to isolate a key forward that, that is likely to be the best available and still somewhat likely, I would say John D4, but I don't think they necessarily need to be hellbent on a key forward. Then we move to Geelong and uh, another team well, I'm not sure exactly what they'll try and do, and it's probably just going to be a case of best available. I think when you're entering the draft at 45, you've got to be fairly open-minded about what prospects are likely to be available. So what types of players will they likely get? Well, they just traded in Bailey Smith, and Tanner Bruin and, and Jai Clark have a, a sort of recent additions to that footy club as well. So they've kind of done their job replenishing the midfield. Key backs, they've got Sam De Koning, um in terms of what's young and drafted Connor O'Sullivan last year. They also drafted a Ruckman in Mitch Edwards. And up forward, they've got Shannon Neal, who uh, looks like a likely type. So perhaps, perhaps there is a desire to pair him with someone longer term. So I could make an argument for Geelong looking at a key forward prospect and then maybe someone like a, a Thomas Sims or a Kale uh, Geron. I believe it's pronounced Geron. I'm, I'm told in my comments, even if commentators call him Geron, but we're talking about the 198 centimetre key forward slash ruck prospect from Western Australia. In an even pool, I know, I know both Thomas Sims and Geron are considered unlikely to be available. I've seen in particular Geron sort of linked in that top 30 uh, conversation as well. But I, I do suspect that in this particular draft, we're going to see a lot more random names pop up a little bit earlier than we're expected because it is considered so even. So you could see, you know, guys like Thomas Sims or Cal Geron go in that top 30 to 35 picks, or you could see them slide a little bit because there's players that don't have the same profile that are quite evenly rated. Geelong in particular could be one of those teams that just picks a random Geelong Falcons product or a random mature age player from the VFL and turn them into a gun. And that is what they do. They actually drive better late than they do in the first round. So again, I'm very wary of attributing a certain player here to Geelong, but if they were going to go a forward ruck in Geron, I think that would make sense. They've got Toby Conway and Mitch Edwards as young ruckmen, um, so they don't need to add a, a full-time ruck, but a player who is capable as a forward and can support in the ruck in Geron probably does actually present something to them that they don't have. So again, it's just a little bit of speculation. I have no idea who they're going to select at 45, but I think there is an argument to be made that if he's still there, there, he would suit their needs perfectly. And finally, we've got Collingwood at 52. Um, every single year, I make the case for Collingwood drafting some tall talent. And, um, you know, in particular last year, they took Toji F and Harry Demetia, um, which I was surprised to see. They did add Membry through delisted free agency, but you've got to look at that as more of a short-term improvement of their best 22 rather than a longer-term list build. So I'm going to make the argument that Collingwood should once again be looking at talls. Now, they probably have a need both forward and back. It's just going to be a case of who is available and who is, you know, the best rated talent. So guys like Tom Sims, Kyle Geron, they're probably still potentially going to be there. 
I wouldn't bet on it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not that much of enough. I do expect that they're probably going to go earlier than, say, pick 52. Certainly, if you look at media consensus, but we do get some surprises. So those are just two names they'd be hoping for. Other names would include Charlie Nichols from South Australia, a really talented forward and back key position prospect that could literally play at either end. I've also seen a link to Clancy Dennis from Western Australia, as well as a fairly decent Western Australian key position player. Then there's some other key position types that, you know, they could go earlier, but it really depends on, on clubs' needs, right? So, so guys like Harry O'Farrell, um, a player who has slid down the rankings this year. I know there's a connection to Carlton, but I, I still think it's within the realm of possibility that he gets to Collingwood at 52. And someone like a James Barrett, who is a little bit of an undersized key position defender, well, he's kind of more of a utility that can play at either end. I think on talent, if he's still there at 52, in an even talent pool, I think there's enough names there for Collingwood to potentially hold out hope that one of them gets through to him. That is, in my opinion, the ideal scenario here for Collingwood, which I suppose is kind of the premise of this video but there we have it those are the 18 teams let me know in the comments what you agree with and disagree with guys and i'll see you in the next one cheers